So this is the second lecture on the KDV hierarchy, and it will be <clears throat> entirely independent from the first one. So it's uh, another approach to the KDV hierarchy that um, represents <laughs> the KDV equations actually as Blucher equations in infinite in infinite dimension. So I will start by showing you the simplest Blucher equation in finite dimension. So let's start with a, a Blucher equation. So to do that, we start, we take the simplest example is if we start with a four dimensional space, C4 with basis E1, E2, E3, E4. And we take E wedge E, so the second, so the exterior product of E with itself, it is a subspace of E tensor E, uh, spanned by, uh, by the vectors EI wedge EJ, which is EI tensor EJ minus EJ tensor EI. So its dimension is four choose two, which is six. For any pair, well, there are, the, <clears throat> there are six pairs of indices ij. For each pair, you have this <clears throat> EI, ei wedge ej, and they form a basis. So a vector that I will call tau in this wedge product has six coordinates. Tau one, two, tau one, three, tau one, four, tau two, three, I think. I won't have space on one line. Tau two, three, tau two, four, and tau three, four. So these are the coordinates, the coordinates of tau. And if tau is actually a wedge product of two vectors, so I have x with coordinates x, x1, x2, x3, x4. And y with coordinates y1, y2, y3, y4. And then tau ij is just a 2 by 2 determinant xi, yj minus xj, yi. So now it is well known that not any vector, not any vector in this wedge product can be represented as a wedge product of two vectors. In general, you have to take linear combinations of wedge products like that. And so the question is, if we are given the coordinates tau ij, how can we know if tau is a wedge product of two vectors or not? So if tau is decomposable, I call tau decomposable, if it can be represented in this way. So there is an equation to determine that, which is tau 1, 2, tau 3, 4, minus tau 1, 3, tau 2, 4, plus tau 1, 4, tau 2, 3, equals 0. So you can check that if you plug, if you plug your x, y, x1, y2, minus x2, y1, and this is x3, y4, minus x4, y3, and so on. You plug, for each tau ij, you plug this expression. What you will get when you expand is zero. This is a small computation that you can do. Every monomial appears exactly twice with opposite signs. So in the end, you get zero. So this equation, so this is called the Blucher equation. Blucher equation. And it is satisfied if and only if tau is decomposable. That is tau equals x wedge y. 
And uh, as a remark, so if we take tau ij to be homogeneous coordinates, so if we take tau ij to be homogeneous coordinates of a point, so let's see. So this equation, it's the equation of the equation of the Grassmannian 2, 4 in CP5. So you see, if we take if we take tau ij to be homogeneous coordinates, there are six of them. So they, so it's uh, homogeneous coordinates in CP5. There is one equation, and you can <clears throat> you can notice that uh, tau ij actually so depends only on the plane span spanned by x and y up to a constant. So if you replace x and y by linear combinations of x and y that span the same the same plane in, in E, a tau only is only multiplied by a constant. All, all coordinates are multiplied by a constant, so it is the same point in, in CP5. And uh, so decomposable points are exactly those that represent <coughs> planes in E, so it's the Grissmanian of planes in E. Okay, so this is the so this is the finite dimensional Tucker equation, and just uh, just a remark already in finite dimension. So suppose that we want to find tau one two, tau three four, tau one three. So tau is that solve this equation. Suppose that we want to solve this equation, find a solution of this equation. So in this case, of course, we we can like fix five coordinates at random, and then the sixth one will be determined, unless there is a division by zero. But the most natural way is just so if we want to solve solve the Plucker equation, Plucker equation, you just pick any x and y and compute x wedge y. And this gives you a solution. So you don't even know, you don't even need to know if you forgot what the equation was. You just remember there was some equation. You can still construct its solution just by taking picking any two vectors x and y and composing their wedge product their, their wedge products okay so now now i will construct Bluecker equations in in an infinite for an infinite dimensional space e and so they will not give me immediately kdv they will give me another hierarchy that is called the hirota hierarchy there was a group of mainly Japanese mathematicians who found this relationship with between the KDV hierarchy and the infinite dimensional Bluecker equation. So there's Hirota, Miwa, Sato. And then from the Hirota hierarchy, we will recover KDV. So here's the infinite dimensional space E. Uh, so it is the space of uh, Laurent series in finite in z and possibly infinite in z inverse okay and instead of the tensor instead of the uh, e wedge e we will take a semi infinite wedge of e so this requires a definition so let me first give you one vector in this one vector in this space that is called the vacuum vector. It's the simplest vector. It is z to the power one wedge z to the power two wedge z to the power three wedge and so on. So more generally, if we take any sequence k1 a sequence of integers k1 k2 k3 and so on in z such that such that ki is equal to i for i large enough so at first you start with n integers but from some point ki is just equal to i so you take the vacuum vector and you modify it in a finite number of places. 
And then you get the vector z to the power k1, wedge z to the power k2, wedge z to the power k3, wedge, and so on. So it will be, it will, it's the vector, the vacuum vector modified at a, modified at a finite number of places. Okay, and since z to the power k1, wedge z to the power k2, is minus z to the power k2 wedge z to the power k1 we can restrict ourselves to increasing sequences so actually we're interested in increasing sequences that stabilize like this and such sequences are in a one-to-one -one correspondence with partitions partitions of any size so if lambda, lambda is a partition, a partition is just a sequence of natural numbers, let's say lambda L, uh, that at some point stops, well, at some point you only get zeros. So it is a non-increasing sequence of, nat of natural numbers. This is a partition, partition of well, of sum of lambda i's. So we don't fix the size of a partition. It's just a partition is just a sequence like that. And uh, to, a to a partition like this, we can assign the vector v lambda. That will be v, uh, sorry, that will be z to the power mi one minus lambda one, wedge z to the power two minus lambda two, wedge z to the power of three minus lambda three and so on. So because lambdas form a non-increasing sequence, these numbers, these integers here will form a strictly increasing sequence. And from some point, all lambdas will, be, will become zero and then the sequence settles to, to the vacuum vector. So this will be, Again, the vacuum vector modified in a finite number of places. And so now we can finally give a proper definition of, uh, of uh, this uh, half infinite wedge. So the half infinite wedge of E is the space of linear combinations of these vectors V lambda. So C lambdas are some constants. C lambdas are in C complex numbers, uh, possibly infinite. Possibly. So this wedge is the space of possi possibly lin infinite linear combinations of vectors V lambda for all partitions. So you can think of V lambda as the basis of this space. It is a well infinite dimensional base. It's not rigorously speaking, it's not really a basis, but uh, I think I'll, I'll say it anyway. So it's a basis of the V lambda is a basis of the space. And we take all linear combinations <clears throat> that are possibly infinite. So the basis is labeled by partitions of all sizes and the vacuum vector corresponds to the empty partition. This is why it is called V empty because it corresponds to the empty partition. Okay. So now, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to give an example. Yeah, let's, let's give an example. So if I take lambda equals four, two, two, one, let's say this is a partition of, of nine and then the corresponding, so V lambda will be z to the power, so one minus four is minus three, then two minus two is zero, three minus two is one, four minus one is three, and then it settles, sorry, z3, and then it settles to z5, z6, z7, and so on. So this is an example. Okay. So now we would like to 
I'm uh, sorry. Yes, yes. I have question. A question. Yes. Why uh, do you um, denote it by um, semi infinite symbol? Uh, well, because it's so in principle, you could also go, you could also continue it in the negatives, right? You could also, you could also look at something like, like this. And then it would be infinite in both directions. Mm -hmm. You could imagine okay. a definition like that. But in this case, we don't do that. We start. So on the left, it's finite, and on the right, it's infinite. But that's it's just a notation. So it's, <clears throat> it's, uh, it explains why, but it's. it's Okay, so now we would like to we would like to distinguish between decomposable decomposable and non decomposable elements of this of this space. So let's try to define to, so to define a decomposable element we need to define infinite wedge products. So let's take power series phi one of z that will so it will stop with z to the power one, and then there will be some coefficient phi one zero, and then phi one minus one z inverse, and so on. Phi two of z will stop at z squared, and then there will be phi two one z and phi to zero, some arbitrary coefficients and, and so on. <coughs> so phi three of z will stop at z three, and then there will be again some arbitrary coefficients. And we would like to define phi one, wedge phi two, wedge phi three, wedge and so on. So actually, maybe I will write a remark here. Uh, one could, one can allow, can allow to, um, let's say to modify, modify a finite number of uh, coefficients in this. So you see there is this half plane where all the coefficients are fixed. Here you have ones, here you have coefficients equal to one, and here you have coefficients equal to zero. So if you really wants to you're allowed to modify a finite number of these coefficients this will still be okay but not an infinite number so i could give a more general definition i i'm warning you because i will actually use it in a, in a couple of in a, in a moment for an example because it's a well, the example works better if you do that so the definition is simpler if you just take fees in the form i told you but actually <clears throat> the more general definition allows you to change a finite number of fees, well, a finite number of coefficients and a finite number of fees in this uh, fixed red part. But so far, let's take them exactly as I said. So then the convention is, well, we just pick, pick a term in each, PK. Uh, maybe I should maybe phi i if I want to be consistent. Phi i. So this will be z to the power k i. But this choice is not is not arbitrary. You are you are you have to choose the last term everywhere except in a finite number of places so so that ki equals i 
for all but a finite number, finite number of choices. So you see there is the canonical choice, the simplest choice. If I just choose the, if I just choose the last term of every phi, then when I when I do wedge, I will do I will just obtain the vacuum vector. If I just do z1, wedge z2, wedge z3, so I, I just I will just obtain the vacuum vector. So now I'm picking any coefficients from any phi, but only but I modify this choice only in a finite number of places. So in this case, I will obtain a correct sequence that will land me in, in the semi-infinite wedge. Uh, so then wedge them, wedge them. So we do the, the wedge product. And as you see, almost all our coefficients are equal to one. So when you do the product, you will have to multiply the coefficients, right? You will have, if you choose, if you choose, like if you choose, for example, this term and this term and then this term, you will have to multiply phi one minus one and then phi two one. But then all the others, all the other terms you multiply are equal to one. So it's an infinite product, but only a finite number of factors is different from one. So the product is well defined. So you, you, you can wedge them. And you obtain an element of the semi-infinite wedge. And then sum over all choices. Sum over all choices. So this, of course, is an infinite sum because there's an infinite number of choices. <clears throat> but you can see that for every V lambda, for every particular V lambda, only a finite number of choices will contrib contribute to a given V lambda. So in the end, you will obtain a linear combination of V lambdas and the coefficient of each V lambda is well-defined. So this is a well-defined operation and you will get, you will get an element of, the, of uh, this semi-infinite wage product. Right? So let's do let's do two examples. Example one. I take phi one equals. So I will take a zero z plus a one. I have to write them. So I have to write them from right to left. Maybe it would have been easier in Israel. So. <laughs> A two Z inverse A three Z to the minus two and so on. So these are just arbitrary coefficients. And as you see, as I promised in my examples, I actually chose one coefficient, not in, well, not in, as in my definition, but that's still okay. And still, and then all others are just the standard simplest choice. Phi two equals Z two, Phi three equals Z cubed and so on. Right, so then what are my choices? So when I expand Phi one, wedge Phi two, wedge Phi three and so on. So I have to choose one term in each Phi, but in these Phi's there is only one term. So there are not many choices, there's only one choice. It's only for Phi one that I have to choose one fee. So let's choose, let's make a choice like this, for instance. Let's choose this term. So this corresponds to the sequence. So z inverse and then z squared, z cubed, z to the power four, and so on. And this corresponds to lambda equal to two. So a partition that is composed of only one element. So this minus one is one minus two, and then it settles to two, three, four. So this is equal to a zero times the vacuum vector. So the vacuum vector is the one that I obtained by picking this term everywhere. 
and a zero is the coefficient I see here. Then a one times V one, a two times V two plus and so on. So as you see, I get an arbitrary linear combination of <clears throat> the vectors that corresponds to one element partitions. So the coefficients of all other partitions. So if I take any partition that has more than one element, the coefficient is zero, but the, the coefficients of partitions with one element are, can be chosen arbitrary, arbitrarily. Let's do another example. Example two. So again, my choice of C's is not exactly as I said. So this is B4, Z inverse plus B3, well, Z to the zero plus B2, Z plus B1, Z squared. And phi two is A4, Z inverse plus A3, Z to the zero plus A1, A2, Z plus A1, Z squared. And then all the following ones are trivial. And again, I want to compute phi one, wedge phi two, wedge phi three, and so on. So now there are no there are no dots here. I chose all of them to be finite, so Laurent polynomials rather than Laurent series. So in this case, I will get a finite combination, finite linear combination of V lambdas. Okay, so let's see what is the coefficient, for instance, of <clears throat> yeah, and also let's denote by delta i j. It will be a i bj minus aj bi. So let's see what is the coefficient of the vacuum vector, for instance. So to get the vacuum vector, I can take, I can make the standard choice like this, and I will get a one times b2. But I can also make a choice like this. So here I and I have one choice, but I can also make the choice like this. And in this case, I get B one Z squared wedge A two Z. So this is a non. This sequence is not increasing, so I make it increasing by permuting the, the two terms, and I have a and I get a minus sign. So now I still get A two Z wedge B one Z squared wedge Z three wedge Z four. So in the end, the coefficient I get, the coefficient I get is delta one two, a one b two minus a two b one. And you can continue. So you have let's say the partition one. So I will try. Yeah. Okay. I'll. Try to erase my circles. Yeah, okay. And now I put back the delta one, two. So now I'm interested in the coefficient of V1. So one choice to get V1 is this. So this I, these I choose anyway. Uh, yeah. So this will give me V1, but also another choice this one will also give me V1, but I will have again to permute the two elements to get an increasing sequence. So the coefficient of V1 will be A1B3 minus B1A3. So that is delta 1, 3. And if I continue, in the same way, I see that I have also delta one four times V two plus delta two three V one one. 
plus delta to four V to one plus delta three four V to two. So you see inside this huge semi-infinite wedge product, I actually find the example I started with of dimension four. So this thing, so these coefficients, delta one, two, delta one, three, delta one, four, delta two, three, delta two, four, and delta three, four satisfy the Plucker equation. Delta one, three, delta one, two, sorry, delta three, four minus delta one three delta two four plus delta one four delta two three is equal to zero so that means that if i look at any if i look at any vector in my semi-infinite wedge product if I look at any tau, any vector tau here, and I look at the coefficients, the coefficient of v, v of the vacuum vector, the coefficient of v1, the coefficient of v2, the coefficient of 1, 1, v1, 1, the coefficient of 2, 1, the coefficient of 2, 2. So, if I take an arbitrary vector, these coefficients can be arbitrary. But if I want this vector, if I want them to be, to be, um, if I want the vector to be decomposable, they have to satisfy. They have to satisfy this. Uh, they have to satisfy this. Uh, this relation. Okay, so I'll come back to this example, and now I will construct another space. How much time? Yeah. Yeah, half an hour. No, that's fine. That's fine. I'm, <clears throat> I'm good. Okay. So now I will construct a completely different space, but it will have the property that it also has a basis labeled by partitions. So in the end, I will identify this semi infinite wedge and the space I'm going to construct. So the space is constructed using the representations representations of the symmetric group. It's really surprising that representations of symmetric group play a role in the KDV hierarchy, but that's the that's the truth. So what is a representation of the symmetric group? It's a map from so it's a, a space V a vector space V, so complex vector space, and a map from the symmetric group to endomorphism, endomorphism, so linear endomorphisms of V. This is a representation. So an irreducible representation, there is a standard the abbreviation irrep, irre for irreducible representation is a representation, representation, representation that cannot be decomposed. Okay, maybe, yeah, that does not have non trivial sub representations, sub representations. And for finite groups or for compact groups, this is actually the same as not being decomposable into two, sorry, into two, two representations. And so the irreducible representations of any group are in a one to one correspondence with their with its conjugacy classes. So here they're in one in a one to one one to one correspondence with partitions partitions of n. For every partition of n, there is one irreducible representation. 
And also for every representation, we have a character, character, chi rho of sigma. So if we take, so if sigma is, is a permutation and rho a representation, we can take the trace of the endomorphism that the representation associates to sigma. So we take sigma here, rho maps it to some linear map rho of sigma, and this linear map has a trace. So the trace is called a character and denoted by chi. Okay, so let's do some examples and enumerate all irreducible representations for n equals one, two, and three, and determine their characters. So n equals one, that's fairly simple. So there is only one partition of one and only one permutation. So the, we only have to find one number. So the corresponding representation is just the trivial representation. So the trivial representation means V equals C and rho of sigma is the identity for any sigma, right? This is a correct group action. Every element of the group acts by the identity. This is an irreducible representation. And the trace of the identity in this representation is one. So this is a <clears throat> nothing, nothing interesting. It's just to, just to check if you understand the, the definition. For n equals two, there are two partitions of two, two and one, one. Two corresponds to the trivial representation. Again, every, every permutation acts. So again, the, the same one. V is one dimensional and every permutation acts by the identity. And one one corresponds to the sign, per, sign representation. So in this case, rho of sigma is equal to plus or minus identity depending on whether the permutation is even or odd. Even permutations act by identity, odd permutations act by minus identity. And there are, maybe I'll, there are two, um, two permutations, the identity and the transposition one, two. So in the trivial representation, the trace of any, well, the trace is always equal to one, right? The trace of the identity map in C is one. In the sign representation, the even permutation acts by one and the odd one acts by minus one. And let's do n equals three. So for n equal three, there are three partitions, three, two, one, and one, one, one. So this is the trivial representation. Again, this is the sign representation. And this is what I call the equilateral triangle representation. So the equilateral, represent, the equilateral triangle is in the plane and if you permute its vertices, this creates a linear endomorphism of the plane. So you can obtain it by acting. So if you take, if you take C3, then S3 acts in C3 by permuting the coordinates. And this is, this decomposes into two irreducible representations. One uh, line Z1 equals Z2 equals Z3, uh, where C3 acts, S3 acts trivially, right? If you permute Z1, Z2, and Z3, this line, this line just does not move. 
And the other one is this triangular representation, which is the orthogonal plane Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 equals zero. So this is the trivial representation and this is the triangular representation. Okay, so there are six permutations, but I won't write all six. I will only write one per um, conjugacy class. So there's the identity. There are three transpositions. Maybe I'll write one, two, two, three, and one, three. And then there are two, three cycles, one, two, three, and one, three, one, three, two. So in the trivial representation, every element acts by the identity, so the, the trace is equal to one. In the sign representation, the even permutations act by one and the odd permutation acts by minus one. And uh, so in the triangular representation, it is a little bit, it, well, so it's, a, it's an exercise to find the trace. And we can use we can use this picture. So you see in C3, when you take the matrix of a permutation, its trace is equal to the number of fixed elements. Because the matrix of a permutation has ones or zeros, and zeros on the diagonal are fixed elements. So the identity has three fixed elements, the trace is equal to three. Uh, a transposition has one fixed element, so the trace is equal to one. And the three cycle has no fixed element, so the trace is equal to zero. So I will write this in, in, in yellow because it's not the final answer yet, but here you have three, three fixed elements, one fixed element, and zero fixed elements. But that's the trace in C3. Now there's this trivial line for which the traces are equal to one every time. So I actually have to subtract one from all these numbers because there's the trace of any, any element on this line is one. So I subtract one, I subtract one from each, each answer and find two, zero and minus one. So the reason I constructed these tables is that now I want to define the sure polynomials and they are constructed using these numbers. I will erase this. And I will define sure polynomials. polynomials. So S lambda of P1, P2, P3, and so on. It is this, so one over N factorial sum over all permutations in Sn, chi lambda, so lambda is, a, lambda is a partition of N, partition of N, and then I can actually stop here at Pn. So for every, so I take the sum of all, over all permutations of the character of this permutation, so the number that is in my table, times what I call P sigma. And P sigma is a product of, so P sigma is a product of P C's for over cycles of, uh, cycles of sigma. So let me do the examples. It will be, it will be much clearer, I think. Do I have enough? Mm. Okay, I'll try to I'll try to find enough room to do the examples here. Okay, so for n equals one, so I have one short polynomial of p one, and it is just equal to p one. For n equals two, I have two sure polynomials, S2 
and S11. So every time I start with the factor one over n factorial. So here I will have one over two. And then, okay, so then the identity permutation has two cycles of length one. So two cycles of length one, I write P1 squared. And the transposition has one cycle of length two. So I write P2. And same thing here, one half. one half p1 squared minus p2. So one and minus one are the coefficients and p1 squared again is because the identity has two cycles of length one and p2 is because the transposition has one cycle of length two. For n equals three, I have three sure polynomials, s3, s21, and S111. So let's do S3. So I have one permutation with three cycles of length. So first of all, I have one sixth. Every time I start with one sixth, that will be everywhere. Okay, so I have the identity permutation, which has three cycles of length one. You want the three. Then I have three, three transpositions that have, so three transpositions, which have one cycle of length one and one cycle of length two. And finally, I have two, three cycles that have one cycle of length three. So similarly, S to one is, so I have one identity. So I have the coefficient two here, right? So I use the coefficient. So I write two P one to the power three plus three times zero times P one P two. So I don't write that the coefficient is zero or maybe I will just skip it. And then minus one, but since there are two, since there are two, three cycles, it's minus two, P3. And here I have P1 to the three, minus three, P1, P2, plus two, P3. So as you see, every time the short polynomials corresponding to N, actually span the space of homogeneous polynomials of degree n. So if I assign to p1 degree one, p2 degree two, p3 degree three, and so on, then p1 is the only polynomial of degree one. In degree two, I have p1 squared and p2 and s2 and s11 form another basis. If I have, if I take polynomials of degree three, I have P1 cubed, P1, P2, and P3, and these three polynomials, these three short polynomials form another basis, and so on. So actually, any power series, series in P1, P2, P3, and so on, is a linear combination possibly an infinite linear combination combination of sure polynomials. So C of P1, P2, P3 and so on has a basis as lambda. And this is the space I was talking about that is now identified with the semi-infinite wedge of E that has a basis V lambda. I just identify V lambda with S lambda. So 
So this is sometimes called the boson boson Fermi, boson fermion correspondence. And now, so the meaning for us is that now when I have a power series in variables P, in variables P1, P2, P3, I can ask myself, does it correspond to a decomposable vector in this semi-infinite wedge space? Right, so let's take any power series tau of P1, P2, and so on. It corresponds to some element in the semi-infinite wedge space. And the question is, is it decomposable? Right. And actually, we already know one condition. It's not the only condition, but we already know one condition. One condition. For it to be decomposable, it's our Bluecke equation. So if I take the coefficient of S empty, yeah, maybe I should maybe I should write somewhere that let's write it here. S empty by convention is one <coughs> that corresponds to n equals zero. So the coefficient of the sure polynomial, so the coefficient on, of one in tau times the coefficient of S22 in tau. You know what? I will write, I will write it on a different on the next page. So the coefficient of S empty in tau times the coefficient of S22 in tau oops, minus the coefficient of S1 in tau times the coefficient of S21 in tau plus the coefficient of S2 in tau times the coefficient of S11 in tau must be equal to zero if tau is decomposable. So if tau is decomposable, decomposable implies this. Well, it is not the only condition, but it is the Bluecke relation that I showed you. So if tau is decomposable, we know that this relation and coefficients <coughs> is satisfied. So now how do we find these coefficients? So for instance, the coefficient of S empty, it's just the coefficient of one in tau. This is just tau of zero. That's easy. This is also easy. So S1 is equal to P1. So that's the coefficient of P1. So I can write it d tau over dP1, and then again taken at zero. Now these are a little bit more complicated already. Because S2, if you remember, oops, something happened. If you remember, S2 is uh, one half P1 squared plus P2, and S11 is one half P1 squared minus P2. So to extract these coefficients, I need, I need uh, differential operators. Actually, you can check that. This is one half d2 tau over dp1 squared plus d tau over dp2. And this is, oops, and this is the same thing with a minus sign. So in the end, we will get a differential, well, we will get some expression in tau and its derivatives, and we take its value at zero. So here is the expression that we get. How many? Yeah, it's half, yeah five, five minutes. So here is the expression that we get. It is called, it is the first Hirota equation. 
So it's denote here order two, two, because they're well, here are the equations are indexed by two indices. So let me write it in this way, tau, tau one, two, minus tau two squared, plus tau, tau one, three, plus tau one, tau three, plus one fourth, tau one, one squared, minus one third, tau one, tau one, 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 plus one twelfth, tau, tau one, 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 one. So the indices here are derivatives. When I write tau one, two, for instance, that means d2 tau over dp1, dp2. And so the first Pluca relation, Pluca relation that I get is that plugging zero into this Hirota relation equals zero. And actually other, other Pluca relations imply that the whole expression is equal to zero. So this is a small miracle, maybe even a big miracle. But so far I only showed you that, that one coefficient of this power series is equal, to, is equal to zero. But actually when you write different Pluca relations, they arrange into, into what is a partial differential equation on tau. You see here you have a partial differential equation on tau and each Pluca relation tells you that one coefficient of the resulting power series vanishes. So in the end, you get, you obtain that tau satisfies this, this equation. And uh, actually you get not one equation, but a whole, whole hierarchy. So all Pluca relations, Pluca relations, give you what is called the Hirota hierarchy. Okay. So now I tell you the plan of how to get from the Hirota hierarchy to the KDV. Maybe I will start again at this point yeah, the next time because it, it will be a little bit short. But let me, okay, let me write the plan. So the Hirota hierarchy is composed of bilinear PDEs on tau. We plug tau equals e to the f. P2, P3, and so on. And then we get what is called the Kadams of Petriashvili hierarchy. Kadams of Petriashvili. Yep. So it's the same hierarchy, but it is expressed in F instead of instead of uh, uh, tau, which is the exponential of f. So we just take, for instance, the first equation of the Kadams of Petriashvili hierarchy is the Hirota equation divided by e to the power two f. So because, you see, because the equations of the Hirota hierarchy are bilinear in tau, every every equation contains e to the f and e to the sum and e to the f times some derivatives. So when you divide by e to the f, what you get is just an expression that is actually even simpler than what you started with, something like that. So this is the first Kadams of Piashvili hierarchy. And then you, you take reduction, a reduction of this hierarchy by assuming, so assume F 
does not depend depend on even variables on p2 p4 p6 and so on so if you assume that you find that what remains so the the term f22 disappears and you get f13 equals one half f11 squared plus one twelfth f111 this is already very close to the to the kdv to the kdv equation the last step is take u equal well equal f11 So I think I will stop here and just repeat a little bit of the last moments because I think it was a little bit too fast and I also have an example to, well, I, I also have some comments and an example. So I will do maybe five, five or 10 minutes of this the next time. I see there are three things, seems the character of ID, sorry. So I, uh, okay. The character of identity should be one, yes. So <clears throat> must be an old question, but the character of the identity is always one. This is perfectly true. And here you have all ones, one, 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 one. So maybe the question, so I don't know where, maybe the question arose from these coefficients. So this three is the number of transpositions and this two is the number of two cycles. This is why you get coefficients that are not equal to one, because in the definition of the true polynomial, it's the sum over all permutations in SN. It's not a sum over conjugacy classes. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking about second line where we have a tri triangle representation, but it was on plane. So yeah, on plane, it is uh, identity has Oh, then, yeah, I see. Yes, yeah, yeah. So the yeah, so the first column actually gives you the dimensions of the representations. Yeah. Okay, so that was the answer to the first question. If the, so, KDV corresponds to no, no. So this is a good question. So okay, <clears throat> so the question is, of course, I was going to tell you, but so the question is, uh, how do you do that? How do you do that uh, in the in the semi-infinite wedge, right? What do, what does this reduction correspond to? How do you how do you determine if if uh, uh, well? How do you find solutions that do not depend on half of the variables? So the answer is this means the space spent by phi one of z, phi two of z. Remember there are the, these vectors and so on is invariant under multiplication multiplication by z squared so remember to get now we get, so to get a solution of KP, now we have a recipe to get a solution of KP. Just pick any power series, phi one, phi two, phi three, as I explained. So phi one that ends with Z, phi two that ends with Z squared, phi three that ends with Z cubed and so on. Take their wedge and you find a tau function of the, so you find a solution of the Hirota hierarchy and then take the logarithm and you find a solution of the KP hierarchy. But then you do not necessarily find a solution of KDV because the, the solution you found generally depends on these even variables. And you would like a solution that does not depend on these variables. So if you want a solution that does not depend on even variables, you should pick phi one, phi two, phi three in such a way that uh, the space they span is invariant under multiplication by Z squared. 
So one simple way to do that is just to take P3 equals Z squared phi one and then phi four equals Z squared phi two and then phi five equals Z squared phi three and so on. So it is exactly the same phi. So it, it, the, the group does not change. It is still the same symmetric group. You do not take a subgroup, but you take, but you need a particular choice of these of these phi's, and namely you just fix two of them, and the rest are determined. <laughs> 